Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you here. And uh, everyone, uh, Eduardo, is uh, hoping for approval uh, in Crohn's disease in Europe. It's good not only for diagenics, but for um, everyone in the entire field. Let me see if I can press the right button. That's the one. Uh, first of all, here's the disclaimer. You read quickly. Um, Renewron, we're a UK uh, public company. Uh, we are working in allogeneic, so off-the-shelf uh, stem cell therapies. Um, all the indications we're working on are significant ones, meaning if we're successful in showing um, appropriate efficacy and safety, uh, there will be a good commercial opportunity for sure. Um, we work in uh, stroke disability, so this is not acute stroke, but rather the uh, working on, on uh, effects, um, uh, chronic effects after stroke. Uh, we work in critical limb ischemia, um, and we are also working in uh, an, uh, ophthalmic disease, retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, so all of these are very significant. Um, we're also working on exosomes, and we'll come back to that. It's uh, very, very interesting, uh, very, very early, and probably worth absolutely nothing for the moment, but could be something very, very valuable sometime in the future. Um, we're we're well-backed and well-funded. Um, you see our investors here. Uh, we did uh, complete a significant fundraise uh, in July, um, 65 million pounds net, uh, so over 100 million dollar fund funding round in July, so that's great. That gives us three years of funding and gives us an opportunity to go all the way through to have pivotal studies completed uh, for two different products in two different indications. So uh, it is um, a, a real, really great opportunity for us to be able to do that. It's very rare. Anyone in biotech will present you milestone slide where everything is funded. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a pleasure to do that. Um, basically means that the pressure is on us in Renewron to deliver because now we have the tools to actually do that. This is our platform. We work in, uh, with two different stem cell products. Uh, CTX um, is a fetally derived uh, neural cell um, that uh, goes into two different indications, the stroke indication uh, as well as CLI. Um, and we also harvest exosomes from the media when we produce these stem cells. So, and uh, exosomes is really a, a pipeline by itself uh, that we're kind of getting for free for the moment uh, in our production. Uh, the second uh, product are human retinal progenitor cells, uh, and this is the, where we have an uh, ophthalmic program running. So this is our pipeline. The light blue is uh, completed. The dark blue is where we are now, uh, and the green, uh, if these colors are working out, don't know, uh, is the next uh, phase or a next step for us. Uh, so what you can see here is that for stroke, we've completed um, phase one. We are doing a phase two study now. Uh, and if we're happy with the phase two results, we will do a pivotal study uh, that will be the next step. Uh, for critical limb ischemia, we are doing a phase one study right now. Um, the next step is a phase two. It won't be a pivotal study um, because we want to learn a little bit more before we go into a large phase three study there. So there will be a, a phase two study, more classic one. For um, the retinitis pigmentosa program, this is a program with just two studies to go from preclinical to approval. Uh, so we're running a phase one, two study uh, first. Uh, that study, we will have the first patient enrolled over the next couple of months. Um, and after that, it will be a pivotal study. Uh, that's a classic program in these diseases. Uh, so it will be, hopefully, a very fast-moving program. And I think, for sure, it will overtake CLI. Um, maybe not stroke. They can fight over it. Um, and lastly, uh, exosomes is a preclinical program. Um, and we'll take the time we need in order to get it right to go into the clinic, but we'll talk a little bit more about it later. So I'll start with the retinal program. Um, it's kind of our newest baby and uh, probably has the most attention uh, from, uh, from investors because, uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about herd mentality earlier today. I think it was Eduardo that bravely talked about herd mentality in big pharma. Um, uh, the field of retinal diseases is clearly a field where um, there's been a lot of success. There's a lot of interest. One of the nice things in this field is that you kind of have a control group from the very first patient, because typically you treat only one eye, um, and then the second eye is the control. 
and it's not a perfect, perfect control depending on the disease, but it's a pretty good one. So you're really getting efficacy signals from your very first phase one patient, and that's great. So, um, so what we're trying to do here uh, is to actually replace lost photoreceptors. Uh, we don't know of anyone else working on this. Uh, so in retinitis pigmentosa, it's not only about reducing the loss of vision because these patients are losing the vision over time. Uh, it's not only about stopping the loss, but it's actually to restore what has been lost by replacing lost photoreceptors. So turning the light back on. Uh, and obviously that is a great uh, thing to achieve and that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're working with very smart people and that always helps. Uh, Skepton's uh, Iris Institute um, at Harvard is uh, where we actually in-licensed um, the technology from some years back. Um, we worked with uh, UCL Moorfields here in London, uh, and we also worked with and got funding from the Foundation Fighting Blindness in the US, which is an enormous uh, charity in, in the US um, that provide not only funding for preclinical trials, but also they're very good at giving you um, contacts with key opinion leaders who, uh, and people who can do uh, uh, good animal models in different countries. So that's also been very helpful to us. Now the RP is our first targeted indication. It's an orphan disease, but it's a very, very big orphan. Um, so it's just kind of right at the edge of orphan, 275,000 patients uh, in the US and Europe. So it's a very big um, uh, indication indeed. Um, we have fast track uh, designation granted as well as uh, orphan, both US and Europe. Um, and ju just to kind of give you a feel for the size of the market, um, Spark Therapeutics just had positive phase three data um, in uh, this patient population. Um, however, it's only for patients with a certain gene defect, RPE65, uh, and that's one to 3% of the population. So if you go to Spark's website, you'll see that their commercial potential that, they're self, that they estimate themselves is 3,500 patients. Um, in our case, our market potential is 275,000 patients. So I'm, I'd rather take our commercial potential than Spark's, but I'd rather have their market cap than ours. <laughs> so. So here's the uh, animal data that we used uh, uh, to get the IND approved earlier this year. Uh, so this is obviously a very quick summary. And if you ever wondered how do you get a rat uh, to tell you if they can see or not? Yeah, you wondered, right? Uh, basically, you put this rat, and this is the RCE, uh, uh, the Royal College of Surgeon Rats. So it's a famous rat model. FDA loves this. This is what they want to see. Um, you put the rat. Uh, inside a drum, so there's a rotating grid, and depending on the s speed of the drum and the size of this grid, you will basically measure, if the rat can see the grid, the rat will move its head. So you're counting head flicks. So this is very well established, but you know, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so here you go. On the left, uh, the first study is do no harm. Uh, so on the left, what you see is uh, rats that have normal eyesight. Uh, so they're not dystrophic, um, and we inject the cells in one eye and not in the other, and what we see is that it doesn't matter, there is no impact, so in other words, there's no negative impact on uh, injecting the cells into the back of the eye of the animal. Uh, on the right, um, these are, so these rats, they have a genetic defect that means that they lose their vision over six months. Uh, so you, you track these rats over six months and see how they lose their, their, their sight. Um, and on the right, what you see in the injected eye, we're able to preserve a lot more of the vision than in the uninjected eye. Uh, we, it's not 100%, so you, in these animals, you, you're preserving about 50% of the vision um, in the injected eye, and the uninjected, they basically lose all their uh, sight. So basically, this is kind of the evidence that uh, there's a potential here of, of showing efficacy. Um, what I'm not showing here is also uh, pig studies the best model um, is actually mini pigs. So mini pigs have an eye that's the same size as a human eye. Uh, and uh, we have uh, looked at important things like integration of the cells uh, into the pig's eye. So uh, what you see is that uh, the cells survive. 80% uh, of the cells are still there 12 weeks after implantation. 
uh, and that's very important in this case since we're trying to replace photoreceptors. Uh, and there is also a connection into the ganglion layer, meaning there is a signal being sent to the brain, meaning, meaning there has a potential here to restore vision. So the animal models look good. Now we will have to try it uh, in humans. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we have a phase one, two study uh, that is uh, about to start. Uh, it's a single center study, uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston. Uh, if you want to do a study somewhere, that's the place to do it. Um, we have three uh, groups in phase one, a quarter of a million, half a million, one million cells. Um, the way these are injected, you see that illustrated here. Um, there are actually, this is kind of normal a day, a normal day for a retinal surgeon. I know it looks a bit harsh. Uh, there are three ports into the eye. Uh, one is actually just a light, so, so the surgeon can see what he's doing. Um, one is the infusion cannula there. That's really just to um, equalize the pressure uh, in the eye. And then the third one is where you actually delivered uh, our uh, human retinal progenitor cells. Um, they're injected into the back of the eye. You detach the retina temporarily. You put the cells in there uh, and out you go. Uh, and the cells will spread around and will stay behind there for a long period of time and create the efficacy that we're looking for. Uh, the primary endpoint here is obviously safety, uh, but we are tracking efficacy uh, in all sorts of measures uh, over time. And again, we, we're treating the most affected eye and uh, then we're controlling both. So it's kind of the standard way to do that. Stroke um, is the most advanced program. Uh, so stroke is uh, the number one cause of disability uh, worldwide. So if we can do something here to these disabled stroke patients, it has a great value. We did a phase one study uh, in 11 patients. Bottom line is uh, safety looked fine. You looked at immunogenicity, obviously, and cell-related adverse events. Didn't see any of that. And we don't use immune suppressants, uh, not in stroke nor, nor in the retinal studies. So immune suppression, we don't use that anywhere in our studies. So that's obviously why we need to make sure that we don't have any adverse events. Uh, and we don't, so that's great. Um, Again, it's 11 patients, it's a single arm, so it's anecdotal at best, probably. Uh, but uh, efficacy looked good. Uh, there's a lot of different measures in stroke. Uh, NIH SS is probably the most used one. Uh, they dropped from seven, percent, uh, seven points on inclusion to three, uh, by two down to five, sorry, at three months. So a two point drop after three months, that was maintained at 12 and 24 months. Uh, and we, we presented the 24-month data earlier this year. So that's encouraging why we've gone into a phase two study. It's still single arm. It's tricky to do placebo control in brain surgery because that's what we do. We, we do drill a hole in, in the head of these stroke patients and we deliver the cells uh, right next to the lesion or where the stroke happened. Um, and uh, that is um, obviously a bit tricky when it comes to placebo. We can do it in phase three, and we will. Okay, so I know it's shocking. Um, in the US, that's fine. We're gonna finish our phase two study with 21 patients. We'll have the data um, middle of next year or second, second quarter next year, and the data on that. Uh, and if you like what we see, we will kick off a pivotal study. Um, that will be controlled by sham surgery. So sham surgery means exactly that. You pretend to do surgery on patients. You actually do drill a hole. Uh, you don't penetrate the dura, uh, so the patient will think he or she had surgery. The surgeon will know that they didn't, and um, the nurse will know, but uh, so it's single blind, the patient will not know the difference. Um, and then you will cross them over later on uh, to make that uh, more attractive for them to participate. Uh, due to time, I'm going to skip uh, critical limb ischemia, uh, other than to say we are in a, doing a phase one study now. Uh, and our plan is to do a smaller phase two study kicking off in the middle of next year uh, where we're going to try and look at patient subgroups. It's a difficult uh, area to do um, uh, clinical trials because you want to do it in patients who are severe enough that they're going to lose their leg soon, but not so severe that they will lose it no matter what you do. And that's kind of the trick to get it the right timing on that. Um, exosomes. So we harvesting these exosomes for free from the media. So exosomes are important in cell-to-cell -cell signaling. So somehow it's a message going from one cell to another cell. And what we think these exosomes do is sending a message to cells to normalize. Um, 
we have a lot of different patents in this field. Uh, there are three different opportunities for exosomes. One is um, to use them as a biologic therapeutic for cancer, because we believe the exosomes are signaling to cancer cells to behave normally, which means they turn back on the cell death. So it means the apoptosis is back on again. As you know, cancer, the cancer is great at hiding from the immune system, which is immune oncology, uh, attacking that, and they're really good at not dying. They're turning off apoptosis, and we think this has a potential to turning that back on. So that's interesting. Uh, the second thing the exosomes are good at is actually to be used in gene delivery. So we're working with Benetech to uh, delivering their short hairpin RNA uh, with our exosomes. So that's another second opportunity we're working on. The third is diagnostics, uh, and we're not doing that one. So other companies can do that. We'll do the first two. So I think that uh, I've, I've reached the end of my, uh, uh, my time. So I'll leave you with our, our uh, uh, milestones, which are very much what I addressed at the beginning at the pipeline slide. Um, so this is our plan. Um, this is uh, what we're working on, and we're actually funded to do all of this. Thank you.